This podcast is brought to you by the Kansas City Barbecue Store, the official provider of barbecue supplies to listeners of Pitmaster. Happy New Year to all you barbecue maniacs out there. Barbecue season is starting all around the country, and you don't want to miss out on this discount from the Kansas City Barbecue Store. From smokers and fuel to rubs and sauces, the Kansas City Barbecue Store has everything and anything you could possibly want. Make the Kansas City Barbecue Store your one-stop shop for all your outdoor cooking needs. As a listener of the OVS Pitmaster podcast, you can get 10% off of your order this spring by using the code PITPOD, P-I-T-P-O-D, all caps, for online orders at www.thekansascitybarbecuestore.com. Welcome to another episode of Pit Master, an old Virginia smoke podcast. I'm your host, Luke Darnell, and today we are going long distance. We're going across an ocean, and we're going to talk to the 2018 American Royal winner, Ed Gash, from Bunch of Swines. How are you, my friend? Hey, Luke. Yeah, I'm good, thanks. I remember when you won. Funny enough, so do I. <laughs> <laughs> It was such a it was such a cool thing to be there and uh when you won and I just think the American Royal is the best barbecue contest in the world. Yeah. I don't think anything compares to it. And to have that that on your your C V is really cool. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the American Royal has always been a bit special for us. It's um it was like our first inter- I say international, our first contest in the US. So as in back in 2012 and you know it's that one contest that you can always go to and you know it's going to be the same people there that you you know that you might only get a chance to see once a year um whereas you know when you go to the jack sometimes you know some people that you have got to know are there sometimes they're not um you know it's a bit hit and miss but at least with the royal it's always it's always it's always everybody's there um and yeah it's it's you know everyone talks about it as this big family reunion and it really is that it's it's my favorite contest one not that i dislike the jack or anything but i just think the royal's more democratic if you get a win you're in and i really like that <laughs> yeah 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 exactly that and you know for, and because there are so many different teams and you know we've built up so many relationships with people that have helped us over the years with equipment obviously yeah, you know, we fly in and we buy a lot when we get there, but yeah, you know, we can't we can't put you know smokers on a plane. Um and you know, it's a bit expensive to be buying new stuff every time that you're over there as well. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's good. It's not like you can roll four new gateways every year. So <laughs> uh, no, no, I'm not Brad. It's, uh... <laughs> no one is. No one's that high maintenance. <laughs> But there are other accolades attributed to you, which I just found out when on the Google machine that there is a UK Hall, Barbecue Hall of Fame. That's pretty yeah. awesome. Yeah, it's uh, I, I, I have come across it. Um, I don't actually know any. I, I don't know who's behind it. I don't know when it was started. I, you know, I, yeah, I, I know. I don't really know a huge amount about it. But uh, but yeah, apparently there is a website with a Barbecue Hall of Fame in the UK. Um, but that's about as far as I know with it. Now, my only trip uh, to to Britain was before I was in barbecue. So I didn't really pay attention if there was a lot of barbecue restaurants or that type of stuff there or not. Are there? It's been a long time since I've been there. There are now, but, you know, I mean, I don't know when the last time you were, were over here, but, I mean, you know, we started competing over here back in 2011. Um, okay. And, you know, cooking at home prior to that. And back then there was maybe two or three barbecue restaurants in in the country. Uh, right. But now, I mean, there, there there has been a huge explosion of barbecue in the UK and, you know, not just American style, but also, you know, the UK has always been a bit of a melting pot of cultures around food. So, you know, pulling different ideas from other places. Um, so, you know, a lot of like Argentinian barbecue restaurants and, 
you know, taking more influence from South America, mixing that, you know, mixing some of those different flavors as well. So mixing like Mexican, I know it's done a bit in Texas, you know, Mexican with uh, influence barbecue as well. So yeah, we're kind of, um, you know, and also mixing some of that with, with traditional English food as well. So yeah, it's kind of um, still finding its way, but you know, we, we do have some restaurants that, you know, I do think actually stack up with places in the States now, are good places in the States. I know there are plenty of not so great ones. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, you know, I think we, we, we do have some that do stack up now. Whereas, yeah, I mean, what, 2011 is 13, I don't know. Yeah, over a decade ago. There over was, a decade ago, yeah. I want to say that we were there in the summer of 2005. So that was way before I started competing. Yeah. Probably about seven years. Um, but yeah, that's the first time I had Indian food was in, was in a little town called Wareham. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's funny that even, even that has evolved in the UK as well. So yeah, we kind of had the typical restaurant Indian food and now we're getting more of the home style food coming out. So again, you know, it's just, interesting to see just constant evolution of things over here absolutely in terms of the pandemic did what how did that affect the competition barbecue scene over in europe um so for us it affected it quite quite a lot so um you know we as in in the uk so for for us me and emma you know if we were to try and get off the island um, you know, we would have to do tests and then test back. And, you know, I mean, I looked at it to do a double in Belgium. It would have cost us something like $7,000. Oh my gosh. <laughs> All of the, the, the hassle. And we were just like, yeah, we're just going to have to take a, take a sabbatical as it were, uh, over those two years. And every time that we thought it was just about to, to open back up. Um, then there was, a, I mean, you had the same stuff over there. Yeah. You know? different thing here and a different thing there and yeah it's kind of um last year was good to actually you know to, to get off the island you know we, we, we me and me and ammo yeah you know, we're used to getting you know to being on the road and out and about like 20 25 weekends of the year yeah. um, so to then have it to a point of none <laughs> it was a, a bit of a shock to us um but yeah, you know, I mean, travels, travels open much, you know, open back up, um, you know, obviously come back over to the States is a lot easier now. Um, and also getting back over into to Europe as well. But yeah, the, the competition scene did continue in Europe whilst we were kind of on our sabbatical, uh, maybe in a reduced state. Um, I think we have definitely seen, and it's, I know it's the same in, in the States that, you know, team numbers are down. on Absolutely. Con- in general, uh, I think, you know, people have kind of picked up different hobbies or just, you know, struggle to justify spending the money. Um, and, you know, and also that that coupled with, you know, meat prices are through the roof and just also difficult to actually find over here uh, sometimes. So, yeah, I think it's been a, a bit of um, a combination of things. But, yeah, I think it, I think it is. Yeah. You got to start somewhere, and yeah, you know, we'll grow back from there. You know, we've been around long enough to see these peaks and troughs, and you know, I think we're just we're just going through it again. It's just a cycle. Absolutely, and I I think we're I think we've hit the bottom of the bell curve. Yeah, in terms of the effect, and I think we're starting to see it rise back up, especially with the advent of new. TV shows that are coming out with Barbecue USA with Michael Simon and the continued other shows that have been on. I think it's, I think hopefully we're going to see a, a teams come back, maybe some new teams. I think there's always room for new blood. That, and I think that would be great. It'd be great for the hobby. Yeah, exactly that. I mean, it's one of the things. So we, we used to teach classes over here, uh, you know, a few years ago. And, you know, we did it for, you know, a few years, yeah, say five years. Uh, and we kind of, you know, thought we'd done our time. We've kind of stepped back from it. But, you know, now we're kind of, you know, again, there's not really anybody else sharing that knowledge and helping new teams get into it. So, you know, we've kind of 
you know set up a, a, a like a beginners you know, i say beginners you know it is a competition class like ride along style and you know hopefully that will bring some new you know some new faces onto the circuit and you know i think it's one of those that if we want this sport to continue to to grow and thrive and you know it'd be good for everyone you know we've just got to put a bit of uh, a bit of effort in ourselves to help it absolutely one of the one of the trips that Kim and I had planned before the pandemic started was to come out there and teach a class. Actually, well, I've uh, got a jambo sitting in a in a, <laughs> in a shed. If you uh, if you want to borrow it, I think that would be person, it. the last person that cooked it in a contest was Taffy. Oh wow, <laughs> that's good to know. <laughs> yeah, we were going to go up to uh, Leicester and cook with um, Scott and Lindsay. Yeah, yeah. And then everything, all hell just broke loose. And I actually texted a friend that I hadn't talked to in a few years this morning. And the last text was him telling me that I couldn't come over for dinner until we waited a couple of weeks for this whole thing to blow over. That was in April of 2020. <laughs> I don't, I mean, so me, me and Emma, we did um, Houston Livestock and Rodeo in, oh, yeah. that would have been like February in of, 20, of 2020. And um I remember it was you know, news was just starting to go on about it, and you know we were coming back on the flight, and you know started to see all these people with face masks, and me and Emma were like, "What are all these? What are all these people doing?" <laughs> <laughs> Little did we know, like you know, a few weeks later, it uh, yeah, it, it went a bit more uh, sideways than we expected. And definitely lasted longer than a couple of weeks. So yeah, yeah. One of the things that impresses me about you is that you have to have a really good confidence in in what you're doing to be able to to translate from basically two different continents in a competition setting. Where does that confidence come from? So, yeah, I mean, so fun, it's funny enough, I, I often think like people think cooking barbecue contests is just about cooking a piece of meat. And to be fair, in basics, it is. Um, but actually I do think there is a, a mental game to it as with any sports. Um, you know, I mean, I played, you know, a lot of sports as a kid, whether it be, you know, rugby, football, basketball, athletics, whatever. Um, and yeah, you know, the, the mental side of it is, is not to be underestimated, but also, you know, you've got to be hypercritical and analytical on things. So, you know, and when we first came over to the US in 2012 and cooked the Royal, it was just actually seeing just how different the meats are Great. compared to what we're used to cooking. Um, so, you know, it took us, uh, you know, it took us some time to understand that a bit better and also understand a bit more of what the, what the difference is in judging is. And, I know a lot of people talk about oh different flavor profiles for different regions and I don't I don't I cook the same wherever I am um it's more tenderness is what I'm focusing on so I know if I want to you know if I'm cooking in in Europe um you know I'll probably you know probably want it a bit more snappy uh than you know if we're cooking in the states where we might want it a bit softer um but that that's really it and yeah it's kind of understanding the differences trying to get consistent supply on product as well so um yeah and when we're in the states it used to be great we we used to love the um smithfield duroc when that was around you know that's what that's the pork we cooked at the royal and you know we cooked that a few years it was all great Uh, and then they stopped doing it (laughs) and then of course we've been scrabbling around with like compar or prairie fret whatever else and again it just cooks a little bit different and just trying to trying to trying to yeah familiarize ourselves with it and because we're not cooking there week in week out um yeah it's going to react a bit different to, to what we cook back home luckily i mean i say luckily over here you know we can get srf briskets that's not a problem um chicken's chicken um right. yeah just those, those ribs and the and, and pork can be uh, the bits that catch us out sometimes yeah, that's what I was going to dive in. I mean, so basically you have to have a a US program and a European program just based on the product probably, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we know 
Um, you yeah, I mean, know, we've we've kind of settled on things now. So, um, you yeah, know, we know what we're going to cook when we turn up and we'll have cooked it before. Or if we haven't cooked it before, we'll order a bit more. Um, and, you know, I, I hate doing practice at a contest weekend because <laughs> it's already a long weekend anyway. But, you know, right. we will do that if we're just kind of a bit unsure on something. Uh, I I generally I used to be probably the biggest practicer in barbecue, especially when starting out those first three or four years, I cooked constantly. And now I'm in the midst of changing product on pork and I know I've got to do it. And <laughs> I, yeah. it's just, how do I, how do I push myself to do that? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Ex- yeah. I, I mean, I've got two chickens sat in the fridge right now. Cause again, we go out to Houston in uh, a few weeks and you know, Oh, wow. Do- Got to do that whole bird, you know, that, that, you know, Texas yard bird. And oh. yeah, it's just like, oh, trying to, trying to gather the energy to uh, think about what different thing am I going to try now? And yeah, all that stuff. That Texas chicken you know, is a different animal. Yes. <laughs> uh, very much. I'll never forget the first time I did a, a Texas contest and I hung the chicken halves in the drum and got this beautiful, I was so proud of myself what I had accomplished and I showed it to my friend Adam with, uh, oh gosh, can you remember his team name? It's been so long. Adam Gautreau. And uh, he looked at me and goes, nope, too pretty. I <laughs> said, what are you talking about? He goes, that's way too pretty, man. This isn't KCBS. You got to cook that thing that looks like a hostage. That's, not, <laughs> that's ter- terrible. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, I mean, that's awesome that you're getting ready for that. Uh, Houston is one of my bucket list contests. I would love to go sometime. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, it is a, a very different contest to say the least. It's, um, you know, obviously it might be fewer teams than, say, the Royal, um, but the actual space. And I, I mean, it's kind of like the cook off is, uh, I mean, whilst it, it is a serious part of it the party side of it is just something else. It's like everyone's team space is actually built up like a saloon. Um, (laughs) You're just walking around with like 250, 280 saloons uh, with like huge parties going on. And yeah, it's, um, I I remember the first year I went, it was like, I remember thinking to myself, if if you didn't have a thing for tall blonde girls in, denim hot pants and cowgirl boots you would by the end of that weekend (laughs) i i don't like any of those things no 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 no. (laughs) god forbid no chance (laughs) we love to talk about barbecue is based on talking about our successes and things that we do well in but i love to talk about failures do you have a favorite failure of yours where you learned something about your cook or yourself that really set you up for success moving forward? <laughs> I've had a lot of failures. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, I was, so one of, one of my biggest, uh, I remember this is a, a practice failure. I remember was, um, I was practicing with a new rub that had quite a lot of pepper in it. Um, and somehow when I was wrapping it, I managed to ping a piece of the pepper up, and it got wedged straight into my eye. And oh gosh! I couldn't get his out. <laughs> and yeah, you know, I was also do- at the same time I was doing it. Oh, I forget what the curing salt is called. Morton's Tender Quick. So when that was a thing on brisket to yeah. try and make the smoke ring a bit, I was also doing that whilst injecting it. And so not only did I end up having to go to to hospital, I had to go to the emergency room to get someone to remove the peppercorn from my eye. Oh my. I couldn't get it out after like six hours. It had to, you know, I had to do something. <laughs> and um, then, you know, also when I cut open the brisket, it was just corned beef the whole way through, but without that good corned beef flavour. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, that's probably the one that sticks in my mind the most. I mean, other ones, I mean, I remember... I remember getting pretty close on time at uh, King on King of the Smoker back in. So we did that in 2018, um, and yeah, I remember Emma had just had uh, knee surgery, 
So she wasn't able to run with the box. So I was like, right, I have to, I've got to run, got to run. And, you know, I'm sprinting <laughs> with it. And all of a sudden, I had too much stuff in my pockets, so my shorts are falling down. My <laughs> And you know, I'm, as I'm sprinting past, like Darren, Sherry, Sterling, Fred, you know, everyone with my, you know, kind of half pulling up my shorts <laughs> and people are just like, let them go. And I'm like, no, I'll trip over them. <laughs> and, uh, I think I managed to get it on. And I didn't even know where turn in was. I was just, I knew it was that way. And I was just like, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? I think I had like, I don't know. I think I had like six seconds left in the end. Oh my. But yeah, that was, uh Yeah. <laughs> not not one of my best moments. <laughs> no, but that King of the Smoker event, that's a great moment. That's uh yeah. That, I got to cook it the year before that and it was just a blast. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's um it, it's a shame, you know, that like a lot of the like I say, the fun contests like that, the real um you know, hard to get into, but when you do get there it's it's totally you know worth all the effort. Um yeah, you know, we used to have one in Italy, so just outside of Venice. Uh-huh. Um, in a grappa distillery, and yeah, I mean, they put on uh, amazing catering throughout. I mean, they hired these guys cooking pizza uh, or and pastas all day for the teams, and you know, these are the same guys that have cooked pizzas for the last two popes. Um, wow, you know, and yeah, it's just <laughs> like a real uh, amazing. And also, you're in Venice uh, or just outside of Venice. You're in Italy. It's just you know, Mediterranean food beautiful weather yeah it's like july time it's um yeah stunning yeah that sounds amazing (laughs) when you go to a contest in europe i mean that's that's a logistical haul kind of isn't it because you're what probably about 70 miles 70 miles west of london right yes so then you have to drive and Mm -hmm. then probably take the take the boat over train so we train. take the train. Yeah, they've got a, the Euro tunnel. So it actually, yeah, you drive your your truck, your van onto the train, and it drives. Yeah, it goes underneath okay. the, the channel uh, in about thirty five minutes. Oh wow! But I live <laughs> three hours away from that. <laughs> right. Um, and then yeah, by the time we get there, we then have another. I don't know, pick a number. How long we've got to drive? It could be the, any number. Yeah, really. Yeah, I kind of. I kind of look at my I when we're planning contests and how far we've got to travel I it, I only ever do the calculation on time from France so once we've landed yeah you know, I kind of forget the 3 hours that I've already done and all of that it's just like yeah, that's think, part that's part 1 you're more worried about part 2 <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> yeah I was looking at the map and I'm like oh man like to get to something in Germany, like that's a that's a Germany's, haul. Ger- no, Germany's not too bad. Austria's not too bad, which is the other side of Germany. Um, the ones that were really bad, I say bad, long um, was we went, we did a contest in Prague before. Oh. Uh, so in Czech Republic, which again is you know other side of Germany, and. It then you know, I had a work thing that I had to be in central London on the Monday afternoon for some drinks thing. And um yeah, we you know had to drive leave straight up before awards drive. Um and yeah, it was just horrible. You know, because I had to get to I think I had to get to you know, had to do something like eight hours after a contest. Oh, brutal. I kind of know my limits. I'm kind of good for about six six, six hours after a contest. Uh, anything after that, I, I, I'm not, you know, I, I prefer to get a hotel and do the rest of it the next day. I used to be six, but now I'm down to four. <laughs> I, I won't, uh, if it's more than four, I'm either spending the night on Saturday night or stopping. And if it's four, it might as well only be two. That's just the way I look at it. <laughs> yeah, part, part, part of part of our yeah, part of my problem is a lot of the contests over here are Saturday Sunday. Oh yeah, we don't have many that are you know Friday Saturday contests. So you know it's that whole thing of um, yeah, got to get back for work on Monday. So it's um, yeah, you kind of just push it. Yeah, 
What's been the most surprising thing to come out of competition barbecue for you guys? It's hard. I, I, I don't know. I mean, we just live in that world. So, right. and we have done for so long. So it's kind of, um, you know, how, I, I guess it's like how blase you become about, oh, yeah, I'm just going to Belgium this weekend for a contest or I'm just going to Houston or wherever <laughs> in the world and you know you'll turn around I, I mean I always remember we did the um Belvedere double in Illinois yeah. um, flew in Friday flew out Sunday <laughs> uh, you know <laughs> short turnaround I, I guess it's uh the, yeah I guess how little sleep I can operate on um I guess the, yeah the other thing is so obviously we we cook on cans and uh one of the one of the great things on that is, you know, obviously if you do uh, party a bit too much on the Friday night or the Saturday night, uh, well, your, your your other half, your wife will kick you out of bed. And funny enough, you just have to get on with it and don't moan too much. But you can. <laughs> um, so, yeah. You can. Emma doesn't have rules? She has no rules for you? <laughs> no. Oh. Don't keep her away from Kim. Kim's got a whole list of rules for me. <laughs> oh no! I mean, the the only rules for me is like, you know, don't stand by the van talking when she's trying to sleep. Don't leave the door of the van as long as she is cold. Yeah, she as long as she is not cold, and I'm not keeping her awake, I can be off anywhere. You know, <laughs> drink or whatever. Uh, I might get a check in from her at like three a.m. Going, yeah, yeah, you got to get up, but. Uh, we're good. Yeah, I get. I have a whole list of things that I'm not. I have to be in the in the bed by nine. I don't have to be in sleep, but I have to be in there by nine, or else. That's the problem. That's, that's the problem with you guys cooking on jambos. You know, it's kind of <laughs> you got to go to bed too early and you know be up in the morning feeding those logs all the time. I know. I, I mean, I get jealous of you drum guys all the time. Yeah, I mean, I think Timmy is like the best salesperson for it because, you know, you look at him staggering around as a drunken mess and <laughs> still gets up, cooks and kicks everyone's ass. And it's <laughs> like, well, maybe maybe that's a different way. Yeah, he's he's a different way. But yeah, I've seen it firsthand so many times that I don't even question it anymore. <laughs> mm. When you first started competing, what were some of the best decisions that you made? Best investments, uh, temperature controllers. Yeah. So you know, back in I say back in the day, um, you know, we were cooking on bullet smokers. Uh huh. And um, yeah, everyone. I don't. I think they still sell them. Everyone used to have these little Maverick remote. Yeah, thermometers, yeah, yeah, yeah. And all you would hear across the whole field was these beepings because it'd be going over temperature and people would be having to get up and do stuff or people just wouldn't sleep. Um, whereas, I mean, I bought, I think it was a Stoker originally, if you remember those. Yep. Um, I bought one of those and, you know, plugged it up to, to two WSMs and, uh, and just went to bed. And uh, funny enough that, that, you know, getting some, having that ability to get some sleep if I wanted it was uh, much needed. I think also learning that, um, yeah, you know, don't stay up until seven in the morning drinking bottles of rum is also a very good lesson as well. But you have to go through that. It's like a rite of passage. You've got to learn it for yourself. Exactly. You can't just go in with that attitude. You have to experience that part of life. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have a purchase of $100 or less that has really impacted your competition barbecue? $100 or less. I mean... So the uh, yeah the, probably a thing in that price bracket would be something like a thermopen. Yeah. Um, admittedly, I don't half my thermopens don't even work anymore. The batteries or whatever. Um, but it, it's just that perfect shape for you know for for stabbing in, feeling what the tenderness is like. Um, yeah, kind of. You know, if you have got one with a battery, it's great if you're cooking a steak or whatever like that and you want to know what your temperature is. But yeah, I think like under a hundred dollars. I'm guessing they're under a hundred dollars over there. I don't really know. They're right around there anymore. Usually get them on sale for about seventy five. 
yeah. So that that would be um, that that would be my 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 go to thing. Yeah, I've now got. I don't even know how many. I've got them everywhere. I travel with them. Make sure there's one in the car. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I can kind of uh, pick a bag, and uh, I will have at least one. Um, and in. <laughs> this podcast is brought to you by BarbecueData.com. BarbecueData.com is your one-stop shop for all of your barbecue competition data, historical data, calls, wins, placements, everything under one roof. It's a great way not only to track yourself in the standings, but also to track how you improve your scores from year to year. Listeners of this podcast can receive 20% off of a new subscription to BarbecueData.com with the code PITPOD. That's one word, all capital letters, P-I-T-P-O-D, PITPOD. So check your team scores, check on others, and do it all on barbecuedata.com. Who has impacted your life the most in competition barbecue? So, uh, so uh, yeah, I think yeah, the people the, the people that impacted us most in competition barbecue. Um, there's two people, really. So. Uh, a guy called Toby Shea in the UK. So he set up the British Barbecue Society in the first place. Um, so the contests that we were doing back in 2011 weren't KCBS. KCBS weren't in Europe at that point, but they were still um, KCBS style. So we were able to learn and develop. And Toby's always, um, you know, was very influential in helping, uh, you know, helping us um develop more uh you know he, he was a more experienced cook than us at that time and you know we, you know we've collaborated on different things like trips to houston or cooking at memphis in may or whatever else like that in the past um so yeah you know he, he kind of actually set up the playground as it were in the first place for us to actually you know get our feet wet and kind of start start doing this competition barbecue side of it and yeah, and then, cool. and then, you know, the second person would be, so I don't know if you remember a guy called Ryan Newstrom. Oh, yeah. So Ryan and Sonia, big tease. Um, so, yeah, Ryan helped us out the first year we cooked the American Royal. Uh, he helped us out with some uh, WSMs that he used to cook on uh, before he moved on to the jam. But to be fair, I think that guy's had every cooker that was ever sold. Probably twice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um but he helped us out with that and i remember um i remember thinking back in 2011 that i didn't cook you know i thought my brisket was okay and then i tried ryan's and i think that was the year that he was like team of the year in brisket i think it was the same one that he won he won brisket in the open i think he did that day uh, <coughs> that year and it was really a um you know that light bulb going off kind of moment. And, you know, Ryan's always helps us out massively, you know, good friends. Um, so yeah, you know, really, I'd, I'd say those are the two people that influenced, influenced us the most. That's cool. Yeah. Ryan's a good dude. I've got to get to spend some time with him and just super nice, super helpful. You know, it's, yeah, I kind of miss the old Iowa teams, you know, when it was like, you know, you had Ryan and Sonia, you had, um, Joe and Kim from Tippy Canoe and yep. Got from Pigskin and you know as well with Luckies. It's um yeah, it's kind of like, you know, Luckies is uh obviously Luckies and Darren are the, the ones still still out there at the moment. We're trying to find an Iowa contest to go to this year. Kim and I try and cook in a new <laughs> state every year, so Iowa I think is gonna be our I, I, yeah, they used to have this contest. I, I'm not sure if they do it anymore, but they had, they did have these really good trophies, which were like these little chrome pigs on top. But then they also had a spam round. Oh wow! So you get the spam trophy as well, which um, I kind of uh, fancied. <laughs> that one. I love spam. I uh, <laughs> Rod Gray recently posted something about he's never had spam before, and I was like, I think you're lying because. I think I've had it with you. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. Okay, let's get into it. Habits, rituals, and routines. Are you guys superstitious at all? Massively. Yeah? 
What have we got? Yeah, certainly. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I guess it's you know. This is the counsel, the counseling portion of the podcast, I think, because people yeah. always are like, "Man, it's too much." <laughs> I mean, I, 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 so funny enough. I, I mean, admittedly, I've used all the luck out of that t-shirt, but uh, I had, I had one. Yeah, you know, I had this one gateway t-shirt, which um, in 2018, every time I wore that t-shirt, we won, including the royal. Is that the original Gateway Hot and Fast T-shirt? Yeah, yeah. Um, and funny enough, Tim Timmy actually got me a, a newer version of it, like a you know probably like there's holes in that things so, and you know, <laughs> a new one. Um, <laughs> and it just didn't have the same amount of luck. It's just like it just didn't didn't, didn't work as well. Um, so you know things. Other than that, yeah, ritual habits and rituals. Everything I, I I tend to cook a lot by time. Um, you know, I, I'm not really that interested in temperature. Um, yeah, you know, as long as it's hot, it's cooking. Um, yeah, you know, I kind of look at it and think about it, but I'm I'm very you know I'll cook on time and I put everything on by the the second. You know, I can be stood there at like six fifty nine in the morning waiting to put you know pork or brisket or something like that on, and I'm like. No, nope, it's got to be seven. It's got to be seven. <laughs> um, yeah, really intense around that. Um, yeah, things like yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't know. Maybe I'm not too bad. I, I'm sure. No. I'll say completely the opposite. That I'm an absolute nightmare on things. But um, <laughs> but yeah, I think I'm all right. I have like a drawer of unlucky shit in my bedroom that I'm not allowed to wear that it just lives there, but I don't want to get rid of it. <laughs> I don't know why. And I'm in this big like Marie Kondo purge thing right now and getting rid of stuff. And I looked at it again today and I'm like, man, I'm still not ready. Yeah. No, no, I, I've got a few, I've got a few ones like that. <laughs> but yeah, that's not lucky. Not wearing that no more. Do you have, uh, are you a music guy when you guys cook? Do you guys cook, listen to music? We do. But it's um, it's not to everyone's taste. What do we got? So you know, I'm obviously from England. Grew up in the early nineties, uh, late eighties. So uh, it's you know, I say rave music like drum and bass. Um, you know, is is kind of what I've always listened to as a kid. Still listen to now. Um, so funny enough, um, yeah. What was it we were actually when we were at the royal um this year last year uh we actually had a, a couple i think from another team poke their head around our tent and be like sorry we just had to see who was listening to drum and bass because they liked it as well but you know kind of <laughs> not expecting to hear it in the middle of a parking lot in kansas <laughs> now i'm gonna have to come check it out myself <laughs> <laughs> but i mean you know I was also guilty of rapping in the middle of the parking lot this year. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, as long, as long as it's not Timmy and that chicken song, just, <laughs> we were right opposite him and we were in a tent. Yeah. We were in an easy up. It was like, we didn't have no protection from no trailer from the offensive sounds that were coming from that corner. Believe me, it was a big shock to all of us that cook on that side of the infield whenever they moved. Yeah, we we were all like, whoa, 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 what's happening? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah, I'm funny enough. I also I'm probably not great for uh, you know when you cook barbecue. I'm also not a big country fan. No, it's, I know that will probably upset a lot of people, but it's just not my thing. Um, I sometimes find it a bit depressing, and I need I need something a bit lively and upbeat to you know get me moving whilst I'm cooking. You're not alone, my friend. I do not have a stomach for it myself. <laughs> yeah. And I, and we always get into contests at a contest of, you know, who's got the bigger firepower. But I generally have the bigger base, so it's time to go. <laughs> yeah, I just, I, I just remember you know, being at a contest before. Some guy was playing, I think, blues or country or whatever on his banjo on, on his porch. And it was just like, just depressing. Just like, no. <laughs> Just kind of right, put my speaker up. It's just like, right, we're just going to get on to it. 
<laughs> what advice would you give to somebody new that's coming into competition barbecue? So I guess a bit of advice I would give to people is obviously you can cook on whatever you want to cook on. But I think um, quite often you see people trying to force cookers to cook at temperatures they weren't necessarily designed for. I tend to think that a lot of cookers have a happy spot. So, you know, if you are cooking on a gateway, you know, it loves cooking at 300. If you're cooking on a jambo, you know, it, most people tend to cruise at 275. They might ramp up at the beginning, but, you know, there's, gen, there's generally a, a temperature that it's happy to cruise at. Um, we used to cook on a backwards, and that thing loved cooking at 230 um fahrenheit so you know just kind of learn what 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 the cooker's doing um and move your timeline around that rather than trying to force it to do something the other way i mean you know you wouldn't want to cook on a jambo and have it running at 225 really hard to do hard to do dirty smoke it's just not going to be great yeah it's just not designed to cook at that temperature so yeah kind of you know, let let the cooker sit where it's going to be happy. I mean, it's a lot easier to manage as well um, going forward. And yeah, kind of, yeah, that, that'll that help with the fire management. That's great advice, man. That's that's great advice that no one said here really yet is let the cooker be the cooker and let that go. That's awesome. Are you a gut feeling kind of cook? Like when something's nagging at you to do it, do you do it? Well, yeah, obviously. <laughs> I mean, you, you ask it like a question, like there's another option to do something else. I am too, but I also have a five foot tall little check in there that she often is like, are you sure you want to do that? And I struggle sometimes with, especially if it's not within the normal time frame, right? Yeah. If like something's colored up quicker than it should have, I, I and I feel like I should take it off, and I've learned that I should just take it off if I want to take it off, and I'm feeling like it. I should just do it. Yeah, and rarely the gut is wrong. That's what I found. Yeah, yeah. It's um, to be fair, we kind of I don't have those issues that often. I mean, sometimes it just doesn't color up enough, and I'm like, well, just you know, cook it a bit harder, and you know, we'll get it there. Right. Um, but yeah, it's um, funny enough. If, if I'm making changes to the schedule or the um, to the program, it, I'm sure for yourself as well. It's a long process to uh, debate with uh, the other half of like, why are you doing this? It worked fine last week. It doesn't need to be. You know, it's like you won last week in whatever. Why are you changing it now? And he's like, because. Fancy. And it's like no. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure you have the same. Are you a tinker? Do you like to tinker with things? <sighs> no, I I, no, I, I, I don't. To be brutally honest, I, so yeah. You know, obviously, we had a long you know, sabbatical. We had our two year break from competition barbecue, and as we came back into it last year, um, yeah, maybe I, I kind of let things get into my head a bit around. Um, things being different and changing and all this. And so we were, you know, messing around a lot. Um, and funny enough, you kind of like, right, I'm just going to go back to what we did. Nothing ever changes. Just cook the meat right. And yeah, it went back. <laughs> oh, I'm not going to like this when Kim listens to this episode and she'll be like, okay. So why are you wanting to do all this shit again? <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I mean, I have had it like, um, yeah, we, we, you do get it sometimes that there'll be subtle changes in the products you'll use. Um, you know, one of the things I've noticed is that things have become less hot. Yeah. As in spicy. So, you know, when I'm using something for a bit of heat and I'm just not getting that heat anymore, funny enough, you then need to start looking at, well, how else can I get that heat? Um, yeah, I'm, Blue's Hog is a lot better now 
but it used to be really inconsistent back in the day of like sometimes you'd get one batch that would be really thick and then you get another batch that's really thin and you know and again like how you know so with a thick batch you might be used to using that and you'd use a little bit of apple juice to thin it down or something like that um and then you get to the thin batch and you do the same right. and it's just too thin so yeah you know, there's little the details are tiny but i think that's kind of what you need to be looking at if you're yeah, you know, if you're wanting to get up towards that top end of things. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow, man, this has been a fun contest or a fun contest podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it feels like a contest. We have to do the social or the rapid uh fire questions. Um there might be a couple of different ones in here for you, but we'll see where this goes. What do you see about barbecue on social media that upsets or bothers you? (laughs) (laughs) Really bad, terrible cooking and people pretending that it's fantastic. Um, I would love to do, yeah, I don't know if you've seen those um, videos on YouTube where people are doing like a reaction video to something. Yeah. I want to do a barbecue one, you know, get a load of teams together, have a few drinks, and then put up some video of someone trying to cook, I don't know, you know, whether it be a brisket or like pork belly or whatever, and just be like the reaction video, record that and put that up. I would pay money to see that. <laughs> but that's what annoys me. You're super right, man. I've been like researching YouTube because it's something I want to get into. And I watched probably three hours of barbecue videos last week on YouTube. And I was, I finally turned it off and I looked at, looked at the, my dog because he was the only one around. I said, I think I'm a worse cook after watching <laughs> like, um, barbecue reaction videos, Luke. Nobody's doing it yet. It's, uh, it's a market. That could be its own YouTube channel, to be honest with you. That would be amazing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's awesome. Do you have a favorite pre, during, or post-competition meal? It's not favorite, but it seems to be what we always end up with is a McDonald's on the way home. It's, uh, um, you know, uh, you, you know what it's like. You kind of you're on the highway. Options are limited, and you just grab what's there. Um, you know, don't have a a pre during. Yeah, I mean, unless you count like you know, beer, bottles of beer as part of your <laughs> during meal. It's uh, yeah, pre- pretty light on the ground food wise. <laughs> All right, next question: Is Liverpool going to make the top four? No. Stop it! Of course they are. <laughs> <laughs> no, I kind of agree with you. I don't think they are this year. It's very upsetting. I, I don't. I don't really follow football that much. Oh, really? Even from what I've seen so far, it's just like, yeah, it's not going to happen for them this year. No, they're pretty. It's the only sport I'm still religious about watching, and the only reason is is because I can usually watch it before Kim even gets out of bed. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I just struggle. I struggle. I struggle to commit forty. Well, I mean, forty hours. Uh, sorry, forty hours or forty weekends to watch yeah. someone and i always used to find myself getting angry watching it rather than enjoying it so it's uh yeah i, I kind of leave that alone welcome to my life right now yeah <laughs> upset especially i've been not very busy the past like six weeks so i've watched a lot of football and it's not been fun for me <laughs> do you have a favorite present that you like to give to people No, I'm a really bad present giver. I just give people money. <laughs> it's just easy. They can buy what they want. That's true. That's true. All right, last question. If you could have a gigantic billboard anywhere with anything on it, getting a message out to millions of people, what would it say and why? You know it's not going to be serious. You know, It would just be like, <laughs> you know, Times Square, me – Little like Christmas bows on the nipples type thing, <laughs> uh, you know, kind of uh, yeah, trying to scare people off Christmas for life. Um, <laughs> something like that. That's fantastic, man! Oh my gosh! Well, 
Thanks, Ed, so much for being on. I really appreciate it. No, no, it's been good talking to you, Luke. Where can people find you online? Uh, we're everywhere as Bunch of Swines. So whether that be uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, uh, Bunch of Swines, we're all over there. Awesome. Awesome. Well, make sure you, everyone out there gives them a follow, checks them out. How many times do you come over here a year? So at least twice. Try to do maybe like three, four, maybe five. Depends. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. so obviously last year was a bit quieter because of uh, things reopening but we're hoping to get back to normal now sweet sweet well I look forward to when our paths cross again yes <laughs> cool. great to see Thank you Luke you. yep all Virginia all Virginia